very much for coming um, to this session on um, privatised enforcement of corporate censorship. Um, my name is Lisa Pearden, I'm from the Institute for Human Rights and Business. Uh, we work on corporate responsibility to respect human rights. And I have a very esteemed panel here. Um, to my left, we've got um, Gabrielle Willeman, Legal Officer at Article 19, Julian York, Director of um, International Freedom of Expression at EFF, Anita Ramasastri, um, Professor of Law at the University of Washington Law School in Seattle. And Joe McLean, um, Executive Director of EDRI, the European Digital Rights Initiative. So thank you very much um, for coming along today. Um, so what we're basically going to be talking about here is um, kind of you know following on from the successful defeat of um, you know so the Sober Bill in the US and ACTA in Europe. And there seems to be this trend of companies being asked by governments and non-state actors to undertake these voluntary measures and um, to combat a range of issues which originally kind of claimed to be combating piracy but is now being justified under the banners of you know child protection preventing terrorism so um you know this is what we're going to be discussing today what are these voluntary um, actions and you know why are they bad for business bad for human rights etc how can we move forward with this how can we move forward to some kind of you know framework or methodology to assess these voluntary measures um but of course there are legal measures that companies have to follow um you know in terms of taking down content and protecting uh, respecting rights, but companies can also take these actions based on their terms and conditions in terms of service, which can be used to justify some of these voluntary measures uh, that we're going to talk about. Um, so the purpose of this session is to highlight some of these voluntary measures, um, but firstly, um, in order to assess what's voluntary, we need to know a bit about what isn't voluntary and what is enshrined in law, and this is different in different parts of the world. So I was wondering if our legal experts on the panel, um, Gabrielle and Anita, could maybe just briefly outline, you know, what are the what are the legal measures in terms of, um, you know, notice and takedown. And, uh... oh. <laughs> so, um, well, I think if we were speaking about this, and to Jillian too, that in the, the, the context is different in Europe, the U.S. and the rest of the world. So, in the U.S., in fact, I think we're still living with Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which provides, again, immunity and a safe harbor with respect to what other users are generating and posting. So it's not a requirement. In fact, it allows for this type of, of censorship and, and screening because there is a liability whether you do or you don't do something. Um, and uh, in terms of, of notice and takedown, that really relates to this issue, again, um, tying into intellectual property and copyright violations. So if there's a violation of co copyright infringement, there is a process mandated by statute by which you actually have to ask for something to be taken down, but there's a due process mechanism meant to be built into the statute. Yeah, um, yeah so in Europe, the main framework is the e-commerce directive, and here I'm going to focus specifically uh, on the, the host liability, and this usually covers usually um, organizations such as uh, companies like Google and Twitter and services like YouTube. And so here what we have is that um, the, the system is designed so that there's an incentive for these intermediaries to take down content because if they don't remove it promptly, um, they risk liability. So basically, the notice and takedown system is derived from a general provision that um, gives an incentive to, uh, to intermediaries to remove content because otherwise they would be found uh, liable. The problem with this provision is that so. I don't know how familiar you are with EU law, but the, the, um, the, the directive provides a framework which then has to be implemented by the different member states and we can implement it in slightly different ways. In many countries this has actually been uh, reproduced very often word for word and they haven't fleshed out the detail of the procedure. So very interestingly in Europe what you have is you have this full provision and it, in fact it's much less detailed than the procedure under the DMCA in the US which actually sets out a number of requirements in terms of uh, the notice and takedown procedure. And that there are a number of specific requirements that you don't find um, in Europe, where the, the only main requirements that the, uh, the intermediary needs to have actual knowledge that uh, illegal content uh, uh, is on the network. So um, I think these are the main issues. And there have been huge problems around the, the system. The main issue for us as a free speech organization is that in practice there's um, a chilling effect on freedom of expression since uh, more often than not uh, there's less risk for, for an intermediary to take down content rather than leave it up. 
So there's also huge legal uncertainty because the, the provisions have been developed in different ways. It's not clear what should be the notice. So um, that is also uh, a big issue uh, in Europe. Thanks, Gabrielle. And Joe, can you talk a little bit about, you know, we know what the, um, the permissible restrictions and the international human rights are. Oh my God. Oh, um, but can you talk a little bit about how these restrictions are being justified in other ways for some of these voluntary measures? Um, well, to start with, um, we, we had a background, we all, ex uh, we all rely on the background of, of uh, human rights law, constitutional law, that <coughs> restrictions on fundamental rights uh, must be predictable, must be based on, must be based on a predictable law. Um, and you have the first, the first Amendment in the US, you have uh, various international legal instruments, all of which uh, specify this. And somewhere along the line, um, the internet means that we don't have to worry about that anymore. Uh, and um, we've, we've moved, there's a, there's a significant shift in how our societies, how our democracies, are regulated and how are freedom of speech is regulated without any discussion happening. And the, the speed and the, the depth of this change is, uh, is understood very broadly. And I think the, uh, the, the UN Office on Drugs and Crime published a report in December 2012, which I think is, is the example of just how lost we are in discussing this subject. Because um, that, uh, in that uh, report called on, EU, uh, called on UN member states uh, to enter into ad hoc agreements with, internet, uh, with communications companies in other countries in order to gain access to communications data. And um, this would be an explicit breach of the UN's International Covenant on Civil, uh, civil and Political Rights. So you have the UN asking UN member states to breach UN law. Uh, it also describes the situation in the UK where ISPs um, can be asked by the police to remove content um, and uh, praised this approach as well. Um, even though this would be in breach of Article 19 of the ICCPR. And uh, they went on to explain that these already very weak measures uh, are actually not implemented in the UK because internet providers don't bother asking for the uh, detailed uh, request from the ISPs. They simply take down the content on the basis of their terms of service, which the UN also finds to be a, uh, a good thing. So um, we have moved from a law-based uh, regulation of a freedom of communication to a completely ad hoc private contract-based uh, regulation of the freedom of communication. And somebody forgot to send us the invitation to the meeting where this was decided. And this is quite a major issue for our society that we need to catch up with. Thank you. Thanks very much. So we've got kind of a good outline of what the framework is and what we're dealing with. We're going to get into some specific examples of what we're talking about. And we'll come back to this um, example of the UK. Um, and the ISPs um, a little bit later on, but I guess the most obvious example is blogging content or taking down content, and um, Gillian, you've worked on this for a really long time, and I know that you've followed this process, this evolution of this process, so I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about your experience from that. Sure, so, so exactly to, to Joe's point, what this means is that you have content that is essentially controlled by private companies um, for more than a billion people across the world. So if you think about Facebook, for example, Facebook has more than a billion users now, and yet their terms of service are not anywhere near in line with the First Amendment or Article 19. Uh, their terms of service until recently prohibited things like breastfeeding photos, which are now allowed, thankfully, um, which prohibit, you know, prohibit things like um, certain types of violence, but not all types of violence, and let me give you an example of this. And then I'll write on some other companies too, just to be fair. Um, <laughs> So one really good example from Facebook is uh, terrorist content. So we all know the phrase, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Now, in the US, the definition of a terrorist group is pretty specific. It includes approximately 19 organizations that are on a list of 
designated terrorist organizations. And as a US company, um, Facebook may or may not have certain obligations. Now, I'm going to give you the I am not a lawyer, um, but there are differing opinions in terms of legal analysis on this subject, so there's no definitive, uh, no definitive answer here. Um, so basically what you have is an American company determining whether or not certain types of content can be hosted on their platform. And therefore, any definition of who constitutes a terrorist is made within those US confines. So when you think about who's a terrorist, I assume that there are folks in this room that are not from the United States. Um, now, there are organizations that the US deems terrorist organizations that in their home countries are legitimate political parties. However, because Facebook or Google or what have you is an American company, they might deem it fit or even completely reasonable to ban that group from using their services. Now, Twitter, until recently, actually took a pretty strong stand on that. There were calls for them to um, remove, uh, was it, I think it was actually um, Joe Lieberman, Senator Joe Lieberman called for them to remove an account from uh, the Somali terrorist group Al-Shabaab last year. And Twitter stood up against it and did not remove it. What was interesting about that was um, that there was plenty of evidence as to why they should not move it. You had a Kenyan police chief quoted as saying, this is our only means of communication with this organization. You had other groups saying, you know, it's important for them to be able to communicate there because otherwise we lose contact entirely. And Twitter stood their ground up until very recently, uh, last summer when there was the attack in the Westgate Mall in Nairobi, and suddenly that account went down. And then more and more of these terrorist groups started to lose their accounts on Twitter. Now, I'm not rooting for the terrorists, don't get me wrong, but a terrorist from, let's say, Hezbollah can be quoted in the New York Times, no problem. They're allowed to have that platform, but they're not allowed to have this platform. And so we have to think about what, you know, what is Twitter, what is Facebook in terms of the platform? Are they media platforms? Are they content hosts? Are they you know, mere um, communications devices? What are they? And so nobody's really asking those questions. And another really good example there is just a really prominent one so that I can give another company a little, a little elbow nudge, is um, the Innocence of Muslims video a couple years ago. You guys all remember that? Um, that was a scenario where you had, um, first the video went down in just two countries. YouTube took it down in Egypt and Libya, blocked it in those specific places. Um, but no Egyptians, no Libyans were consulted in that endeavor. Um, I talked to them, they weren't, not even the local offices. Um, and in that case, you know, it looked very much like YouTube was just trying to do the right thing. There's violence happening on the ground, let's block the content. Okay, you know, I actually can see the thought process even though I don't agree with it. But once you started digging into it and looking at the reports, find out that there was a State Department call and so the State Department, at some point, pressured YouTube to take the video down entirely. YouTube conceded by taking it down only in the two places where there was potential violence against embassies. Now, I actually think in that case, YouTube may have done the best that they possibly could, but I'm gonna argue that that's not good enough. Um, I don't think that they should be making decisions over what constitutes hate speech, for example. Um, they, have the, they have the ability to be as in, pretty much in line with the First Amendment, um, but they choose not to. Thanks, Vinny, and that's like really good examples of where governments have exerted pressure on to take these voluntary measures, and hate speech is a really good example because it's so contentious and means something different in every country. But what about when you know the company um, faces pressure from non-state actors to take down content? So I know Nita, you, you, you know that was a good yeah. example of this as well. Yeah, and actually I was going to say, I'm working with the Institute for Human Rights and Business on a project called Digital Dangers, and so we're looking at not only state actors, but non-state actors and users and others who are also attempting to influence companies. Um, and I'm actually going to turn the floor over to someone who's a more expert in this, but a good example in terms of user-generated requests for content to be censored or taken down uh, comes from India, where, where companies are facing both the government, but they're also facing users. And so the Center for Internet Study did a great project where they sent basically fake, created takedown notices, one of them with respect to the course of the labeling of baby diapers. And so Pranesh Prakash can talk about that, um, where companies were basically, without engaging in any kind of do, do process or examination or just actually asking whoever posted the content, what did this mean, why is it there, is it correct, is it accurate, just took it down because that was an easier way to basically remain immune and safe. So I think as we talk about this issue of, of, of do we have 
rights anymore. We need to think about not only the government, but we really do need to think about non-state actors. And Jillian, I think with your point about the tariffs, I think what you're talking about in terms of the U.S. law and this issue of do, do you have to take down al-Shabaab or, or any other terror, terrorist groups, content relates to U.S. law material support to terrorism. And I think there is a great debate about, you know, is allowing content to be generated and posted material support, but you find people who say absolutely yes at, um, as well. So Pranesh um, is from the Center for Internet Studies, and so maybe you want to talk a bit about your experience because you ran the study. Sure. Uh, <laughs> Come into the live stream. Thank you. So uh, as Nita already said, uh, we ran a study uh, in after the information technology rules, IT rules were passed. Uh, purportedly about intermediary uh, liability, but actually they created a new system uh, of, of notice and takedown. Uh, actually, no, just more or less takedown, because uh, the notice was to the company uh, that was either hosting or in any other way uh, was linking or was uh, an ISP or just was an intermediary. Uh, once notice was sent to them that uh, they were, they had, they were, uh, either hosting or linking to, etc., etc., something that is potentially unlawful and unlawful not as defined under regular Indian law, but under this particular thing, under these particular rules, which included things, for instance, something that is disparaging was included in this. Uh, and why was it included in this? Because the terms of service for Yahoo and World of Warcraft, etc., went beyond regular law, didn't just include what is defamatory but included stuff beyond that, including things that are disparaging, things relating to gambling, whether or not that is covered by, by uh, Indian law. So, uh, so even things that were not unlawful under Indian law were suddenly being made unlawful under this law because they were copied from terms of service of private corporations. After that, we decided to actually send uh, fake, fraudulent, frivolous notices to uh, these, uh, com to a number of different kinds of intermediaries. In each case, making sure there was some flaw or the other in the request that we made, uh, even under the parameters of the IT rules. So they should have been rejected, uh, but we found that in in six cases out of seven, they actually complied with uh, with our requests. And uh, and in none of these cases is there any indication that they. Uh, you know, sent notice to the person whose content it was that we were asking to be removed. Uh, in no cases there uh, is there any such evidence because like no one wrote back to us asking us why are we asking for this content to be removed. All in all, uh, we found it incredibly easy to engage in censorship online and worst of all, it was invisible censorship. It was not like a book ban or, or a movie ban where you know that something has been banned. The content that we asked to be removed, we only found out that it was removed because we kept looking for it day after day to see whether it had been removed. If people weren't doing that, you wouldn't find out about it. Thank you so much, Pranesh That's actually a great point. I just wanted to note something in the evolution of this process is that um, I used to be really frustrated with uh, a lot of the company's procedures when it came to this. And I noticed something just a couple weeks ago with Facebook that I just want to kind of give a little bit of praise, especially after it's been so critical. Um, <laughs> But they have actually instituted a thing whereby when you report a piece of content, it actually it comes back and tells you what happened to your report. So if I report something um, for violating the terms of service, I'm now alerted to that in my, my dashboard. And it shows me um, this piece of content was taken down because it did violate the terms of service, or this one wasn't. Which is a new thing, and I would like to see more companies at least achieving that level of transparency, if not changing their terms of service altogether. And it's actually... Uh, that's something um, you know, which is very good news because I was just going to share with you an experience that we had at Alpha 19. Um, just so you know, we're like an international free speech organization based in London. And so, like many uh, civil society organizations, we, we use social media, so we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, and so on. And so, uh, one of my colleagues posted a, a comment on our Facebook page which was about torture in Syria and literally linked to a Human Rights Watch report. And one day we just <laughs> woke up to find out that the, the content had been removed. And here's exactly uh, what Jillian uh, and 
Bangladesh have described, like we had no idea what happened. So at the time, because this was I think back in 2012, and so we just found out that it had been removed and no explanation, no nothing. So essentially, um, we didn't know who uh, had asked um, for the content to be removed, we didn't know why the content had been removed, we hadn't, you know, we just found like the blank page and, and so um, at the time there was no process. We still managed to get in touch uh, with Facebook, uh, mainly via, um, uh, I think it was Twitter, or trying to get in touch with their communications team, and eventually we, we, we tried to have a meeting with them to, to get an explanation. But it was far from satisfactory at the time, although you could see that there were some processes to report inappropriate content, there was no such thing when it came to um, um, yeah, unjustified uh, takedowns of content. And here, what's actually interesting is that it was not even anything graphic, it was not even those breastfeeding pictures that they used to remove, it, it was just a link. It was linked to a human rights watch report about torture in Syria, which was arguably uh, in the public interest. And, and the only thing we could surmise was that in that report there were depictions and drawings of uh, torture positions, and we thought maybe that's what it is, but we actually never found out what happened. So it's really good to hear um, you know, that so better procedures are being put in place, and uh, it's to their credit. At the same time, again, as um, both Jillian and Panesh were pointing out, what's really disturbing is that it's very invisible. Like, because at the end of the day, even though it, these companies have become, you know, they, they may not pre-screen what, what goes online, but since they still take it down under the terms and conditions, in a way they still decide what, what, what people can access and, and see online. So somebody is making a choice and that's what people get to see. So it's, it's, it's a very strange new way of um, accessing information. Uh, it's a very invisible uh, censorship. And what's interesting about your example is that you don't know um, how that came about. You don't know if no. it was like lots of people in Syria reporting that page, or who was you know was it pressure on the company from non-state actors or state no, actors? It's like there's very little information. I mean, we got an apology, but no real explanation. But it's good to know that there's. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, you know, there were even darker days before that. I remember back in 2009, both with YouTube and Facebook, uh, which happened to be just you know the the most common places where content goes down, and you can see why. One hosts a lot of. One hosts video solely, and so video can very easily go awry pretty quickly. Um, and the other hosts a variety of different types of content. And now with Google Plus and things like that, it's become a little bit more diverse. But back in the day, those were the two platforms I would get the most complaints about. And there were, like I said, there were darker days before where um, you know you would get a, an email if your content was taken down that just said this decision is final and cannot be appealed. Um, and then Facebook and YouTube both instituted appeal systems and. YouTube actually, um, to their credit, around, oh God, I can't credit it to the Syrian uprising, but it was around that time when they changed their policy to allow certain types of violent and graphic content um, if it was in the public interest or if it was for educational purposes. And that's the kind of thing where we have seen evolutions in terms of service, just like Facebook now allows breastfeeding photos. And these are arguably in response to public interest. Um, and so my argument to that would be that all of us need to be doing more to put pressure on these companies to allow more content. Thanks. Just, just two quick points. I mean, one of the things Pranesh mentioned, and the reason I think Indian, the Indian example in your study is interesting, is we're talking a lot about terms of service, and, and, and in India, the, the, the reverse is happening, right? One is, you know, companies using terms of service to deal with government or other requests, but seeing terms of service become part of and legalized in terms of how a government deals with things. I think is also just is, is cautionary and, and a concern. Um, and in terms of this issue of just what's silent, another piece is so one is removing the content, the other is burying it. And so with respect to um, the Indian diaspora in the United States, when there are objectionable blogs, basically you will have a group wanting to just basically report a blog, um, and then suddenly it's it's not gone, but it's very hard to find. So I think there are a variety of ways in which I think companies need to be vigilant about this issue of, of, of the user pressure. So this has been, you know, we're talking about social media companies at the moment, but there's also, you know, there's other service providers that are, are feeling this pressure from, from governments as well. And I just want to come back to the UK example of the internet service provider. Joe, do you want to outline the, the example? And then we have um, Larry Stone from BT in the, in the audience who's very kindly said that he's going to give the business side of the story as well. So that's great. Joe. 
On reflection, I was thinking I might take uh, a Swedish example just to uh, provide more geographic uh, spread. Um, first of all, on the terms of service point, I think it's it's really important that businesses need to realize that, um, that weak terms of service are arbitrary terms of service, are an invitation to uh, states to misbehave. Because if the companies believe that in the terms of service that arbitrary behavior is okay. And if the government believes that arbitrary behavior is okay, then they don't have any opposition. Um, so in, uh, when the European uh, review of telecommunications law was being done a few years ago, um, the units responsible for redrafting the law were sitting around the European Commission in Brussels going, well, we think that more should be done to protect copyright. But I wonder what we can do, what's appropriate. And one of them came up with the idea of looking at the Belgian ISP's terms of service to see what they thought was reasonable. And in the Belgian ISP's terms of service, it said that they gave themselves the right to remove uh, accounts if they felt that something inappropriate was being done with uh, the internet connection. So the European Commission said, well, if the ISPs think that is an appropriate way to, uh, to behave, then, then so do we. <coughs> and the Commission then went forward with a proposal uh, broadly similar to the three strikes system. So, um, in terms of uh, companies then being ambushed, uh, in Sweden a few years ago, Telia did a, uh, a test of uh, internet blocking uh, to, to block uh, child abuse material. Uh, and they did their testing and they came to the conclusion that there's no point. It doesn't actually serve any useful purpose. So resources should be focused uh, on doing something that actually works. So they did the research and Sweden being Sweden, they were very transparent and we made this information available. We looked at it, we decided it wasn't going to be useful. The press, however, decided that blocking bad stuff must be good. And why doesn't Tilia? do more to stop bad stuff happening. So they ran, there was a press campaign, and Tilia said, you know what, we really couldn't be bothered. DNS blocking is cheap, it doesn't actually achieve anything, it's not worth their while if it's bad publicity. So they introduced uh, web blocking. In the meantime, uh, they now have like, web, web blocking in place for the last uh, seven or eight years. Um, they receive a blocking list every two to three weeks. So every 14 to 21 days, approximately, the police send them a blocking list. <coughs> On average, according to the British hotline, the websites stay online an average of 12 days. So that means, approximately on average, more than half of the websites that are being blocked at any given time by Tilia don't exist. But who cares? There was no democratic process that would have weeded out the fact that it was pointless. There was no evidence base to suggest it was a good idea in the first place. The government is able to say, well, somebody's doing something. Isn't it great that somebody's doing something? Every, everybody loses. The victims lose. The, the ISP loses. The society loses. Everybody loses because there's no democratic process. And last year in the UK, last summer in the UK, um, the uh, police force uh, child protection unit was having its budget cut by 10 million pounds. And the government felt exposed. What can we do, we wonder, to hide this? So they ran a press campaign saying, why doesn't Google do more? Do more than what? Nobody knows. More. And uh, Google was in the press for, for negative reasons anyway, so what the heck? And they now have a keyword filtering system, which uh, I don't expect Google to respond to this. Google knows this is pointless. The government knows this is pointless, and nobody cares. <laughs> the, the democracy, as, as Churchill said, is the worst form of government apart from all of the others. But at least it filters out some of the more ridiculous measures that are done when it's politics, when it's public relations. And I can't even remember the question that I was asked before I started. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I just ask 
one thing too. In the UK, is it not a non-governmental organization that determines some of this? Oh, don't get me started. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, talk about accountability. Yeah, yeah another, another panel. <laughs> that one. But that, another example from the UK as well, that around the time that this was all happening, was that um, there were, the ISPs were also being asked to um, filter pornography um, in general out of um, the, the internet connections. Now, what this was another very big press campaign. And what was happening was that David Cameron was talking about um, pornography and child abuse images in the same conversation. So you immediately have this connection between something, you know, completely illegal and something that, you know, so, but I was wondering, I mean, this, this has been going on for a while now, this filtering of, um, it's been implemented, it's an opt-out process for your um, internet service in the UK, and um, it doesn't seem to be working. So I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna think on Larry from BT, if you could maybe just give us the, the business side of the story. Yeah, please do, and thanks so much for it. No, it's always, it's, uh... It's always a pleasure to talk about pornography uh, in, a, in a public context. Um, so thank you very much indeed. No, I, um, I wanted to... I mean, we don't want to be, I'm sure no one does, uh, the arbiter of taste and decency. Um, certainly my taste is quite poor, um, so I shouldn't be involved uh, in any of this. Um, but there are two sorts of things that have, that have happened which have been conflated, as you said. One thing is illegal child abuse imagery, which in itself is, you know, there are grades, um, and I think there's grade one to five in, in Britain. I, I, I don't know how it's graded, but it's graded. Uh, and we run a, a, a site working with the police in terms of uh, this sort of material. Um, so we've worked for many years with a thing called the Internet Watch Foundation, uh, which has a, a series of sites which, uh, through a clean feed filtering system, uh, um, I'll start again, no. Um, uh, we, um, we, we, we take down. We take down. So that, that sort of material. And we rely on a third party. Whether that's a democratic process is a, is a question we can debate. The second sort of issue, which is the point you made, which is a political campaign, which is conflating things which no one wants, which is abuse of children, with grades of pornography. Um, and the way it's developed through a thing called the Bailey Review in the UK is really a debate around uh, uh, who, should, uh, who should have control, in particular what children uh, watch. Uh, and, and our view is that uh, this is really a matter for parents, you know, children are different ages, different stages of development, it's really up to the family to try and, to try and do that. But certainly default on is completely, completely wrong. So what we've done, under uh, frankly huge pressure, as, as people on the panel will know, from the media, from politicians, I and mean, quite intense, unpleasant pressure, not just on us because we're used to uh, you know, being hated from time to time, um, is um, to put in place um, your parental controls, uh, the ability for parents to put in, in place different types of filtering. We've put in sort of network-based and device-based device filtering so that people have the choice about what they want to do at homes in terms of what sites. Then the question, of course, immediately comes in, when, when are you overblocking? Um, and so there's a constant refreshing process. We've found the number of complaints are reducing, but do we want to be in that position constantly? But that's going to be a, frankly, constant debate. So, so. Is that opt-out? Just to clarify, is that opt-in or opt-out? Actually, it's, 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 it's opt out. So parent, parents have a choice. It's, the choice is with the parents, the family. So we call up and say, please, can I have some porn? Oh, no, 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 no. It's, the, it's, it's there. You decide what not to receive. But can you say that about you know, these filters came in place, but it's starting to block you know, um, health, other content like that? Um, yeah, sure. There's, 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 there's inevitably, because these things are complex, there's inevitably a, um, you know, a, 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 an inadvertent um, overflow. Um, and you know, as, as that, so there's, there's a, a week on week, a month on month debate about, about, about changing that. For example, you have lesbian and gay transgender line issues in the UK. So it's a constant battle. We don't particularly want to be in this position, but it's been, there's been a big, big public campaign about it. So, yes, yeah, so just to be clear, you have like, the overblocking issue, mm -hmm. which is, for example, it catches or something about sex education. Sure. And Precisely. then you have the fact that actually there's been a sort of mission creep whereby yeah. you've had an increasing number of categories of content mm. being added yeah. um, and now being filtered. Yeah. And is there a legal basis for that? That is a very good question. I mean, you're the lawyers. Tell me. Uh, no, I think yeah. it's, I think it's an extremely, uh, it's extremely, well. it's extremely, extremely difficult position because you're basically you're at the heart of a of a country, and you're, you're you're surrounded by an enormous amount of, you know, and it's not just um, you know political pressure and uh, 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 media pressure. It's also you know lots and lots of NGOs which are not represented here, requiring it. So it's, this is a this is a different 
uh, sort of set of NGOs, if you see what I mean. <laughs> That sort of reminds me, I mean, of, for the company that I haven't picked up yet, um, sort of reminds me of a few years ago when Microsoft being launched and they decided that they would um, block, in certain, only in certain jurisdictions would they block certain types of sexually explicit content, or rather, they would put on safe search by default, but it wasn't very transparent that they were doing so. And my favorite example of this, just to speak to what you were saying, is that um, in the Arab world, which they for some reason lumped together as the Arabian countries, I don't know who gave them that idea, um, they blocked a bunch of terms related to sex, including the word breast, but that resulted in blocking chicken breast and breast cancer. Um, and when we asked them about this, they said, oh, but that's what the people of that region want. And I said, but you realize that only a handful of countries in that region actually censor the internet. And that's true. You've got to probably at the time, 2010, six or seven countries in the Arab world did not censor the internet at all. That's changed, of course, in response to, uh, to the events of 2011. But nonetheless, I mean, it's a Western company making decisions for what they think is best. Talk about paternalistic. Thank you so much, Larry, for taking the mic from that. So before we move off from blocking content, does anyone have any questions that they want to ask? Pranesh? Oh, should I go for mine? Uh, sorry, should I just ask him for the gen? Yeah, it's being fed. Thank you. Uh, We've mostly been focusing on, on large corporations as intermediaries. Now, uh, it, it's one thing to say that Facebook, which has upwards potentially of a billion users, uh, and which many people compare to states uh, to, to apply the same standards as, say, the First Amendment or, or some, other, uh, some constitutions of the world. But if I am running a private server, I'm hosting stuff for some other people, and I don't want, say, chicken breasts or anything related to breasts on my website, then I should have the freedom to, to object to, to those who want to host stuff on my website, right? How do we draw the distinction between those large corporations which are more state-like and those which aren't? That's a very good question. I think everyone is <laughs> nodding going. Uh, one, one of the things that, that I'd really like to come out of this uh, discussion is some momentum towards, towards a methodology for addressing the totality of these issues. On your particular point, you, you give an, an easy example which allows an easy response, uh, thankfully, uh, which is, if, you, if you're a small ISP, a oh, hosting provider, and you have a clear rule, a clear predictable rule, and you have 99 other hosting providers that are perfectly happy to host information about chicken breasts, then um, you go somewhere else, and you host your site, and you're safe, and uh, there's no issue. There are cat people, there are dog people, I imagine there are cat people hosting, uh, providing hosting services that would hate to have dog pictures on their websites. It's not much of an issue because you go somewhere else. On the other hand, you look at some of the big companies' terms of service, one of them says in relation to one particular type of content uh, that they reserve the right to remove uh, the uh, remove apps from their store at any time, for any reason, or for no reason. What the hell does that even mean? Um, and there you've got a problem because you don't, you don't know what the rules are. You know, the rule is the company can do it the help wants. And um, if you do a search for any reason or no reason uh, in your favorite search engine, you will find tens of thousands of terms of service using those words. And that's where you get it. So is there competition? Is there clarity? would be two questions that would fit into such a methodology. I think that point, the competition piece, which is, again, and maybe the duties change depending on whether there's competition in the market, but you can imagine starting to come up with a matrix or a chart looking at what service am I providing, what is the size of my market, is there competition, um, and, and then what kind of a platform am I advertising, because I think that's the difference too. I mean, you can have a billion users who want to be a no chicken breast Facebook yeah, JPEG is the yeah, perfect yeah. example. So that, that, that you know, even at that level of, 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 of 
participation, we're still not going to always expect the same thing. So part of this is about, I think, also how you are, your perception of, of what you are doing as well. But, but so some kind of continuum and matrix of, that takes these factors into account. Right. Account. And to be fair, I don't think that we can say that Facebook or Google doesn't exist in that category at this point. I mean, in order to participate in the White House Town Hall online, you had to register for Facebook. In order to use Spotify, you have to have Facebook. So you're blocked out. And I mean, in order to participate in the political scene in Egypt at this point, you have to be on Facebook. Like, you're pretty much blocked out of certain parts of public life if you do not have a Facebook account. And Google, I mean, is an even bigger problem just because it has so many more services. So, you know, on the other hand, if JDate says, no, we are a dating site for Jewish people only, I'm like, that's cool. There's Muslim date, there's Christian date, there's eHarmony, there are all of these other options. But with Facebook, uh, Google Plus, I'm sorry, but it's not really an alternative. Like, what are my alternatives? <laughs> they don't exist. <laughs> Thanks. Any more questions? Oh, it's um, on top blocking before we move on. No. Okay, thanks. So I was gonna we're gonna move away from the blocking content, but that, that's all right, and um, <laughs> and move on to other um, voluntary measures that we're coming across. And one of them is um, blocking of payments to to sites as well, which is something that Anita was gonna start off giving us some examples on. Yeah, well I think again it's just the issue of, of payments providers are just important and complementary intermediaries. And so they have worked actively with governments in the criminal context to deal with issues like pornography, child pornography and gambling. And so with the WikiLeaks example, you see the, you know, the same payments providers moving in and again, cutting off the payment gateway, which is essential for businesses to be able to operate. So it has the effect of censorship because if you can't function, right, then you can't, you can't operate and publish. So I think you, there's just a concern there because the same kind of discretion exists in the world of payments providers. One, they work very actively with governments and very often may find themselves subject to kind of government suasion in turning off payment networks when perhaps they shouldn't. That's one piece, that's kind of the WikiLeaks example. The second piece is that, just as we've been talking about terms of service, the, the payment network's rules are proprietary and private. Like we couldn't sit in here today and I couldn't hand out copies of the Visa and MasterCard network because it's a trade secret. Um, it's not that secret, but the discretion that's allowed within that to shut down a, a merchant account and to stop money going. I mean, a, you know, a separate issue that's going on right now is we're, we're looking at Bitcoin and other types of payments providers. Why are they popular? Well, perhaps because people want to buy drugs, but also because they provide an alternative conduit that isn't going to create those same kind of pressures for people who want to operate and publish. And this is an interesting like evolution of how this happens because blocking payments is incredibly successful in you know taking um, you know in the impasse that it wants. And I, I kind of re remember when um, Visa discovered um, you know in the late nineties or early two thousands that their products were being used to buy child abuse images online, and they said absolutely this is not going to happen. And they were so successful with blocking all the payments that it's now you, you can't pay for it. It's now a trade. So it kind of it took it away from a monetary transaction to something else, which is even more difficult. To stop. So even though they were very successful, it kind of now moved into another domain, and it's kind of like completely to think about the consequences of you know those, those actions as well. But now we've seen you know the examples of, of WikiLeaks going on. This you know, blocking payments is an incredibly successful way of taking people offline. I don't know if the panel have any other comments on that. I think going back to my my Swedish points, um, I think that it's completely forgotten. Uh, in a political context, or maybe it, nobody cares, but um, private companies can actually only do so much. And they're not criminal police, they can't put people in prison. And um, whatever action is taken is going to have a response of some description. And these things need to be thought through. I mean, either you care about the infringement that's happening, or you don't. And the visa example that you gave is, is one. Um, and there's, a, there's another one which I, I kind of wouldn't believe if I hadn't been there. Um, there was a, a discussion in the European uh, Commission a few years ago on notice and takedown. And uh, they were dealing with um, terrorism, child abuse, and something else I can't remember. Um, and on the issue of, of child abuse images, the, the representative of the European Commission said, well, the problem we have is that in some European Union member states, the police don't really do anything when they get reports of child abuse material being hosted in their country. 
So the solution we've come up with is that we get the hotlines that receive the reports of uh, the, the illegal material to enter into an agreement with the police that if the police don't act within a certain number of days, the hotline can contact the internet provider directly and get the content removed. And I put up my hand and said, I think I misheard. Are you telling me that the European Commission, faced with EU member states, receiving information about serious crimes and not acting, your solution is to institutionalize the act of, not act of doing nothing by agreeing that if they do nothing for a few days, the ISP will take care of the evidence of the inaction. And the response, and I quote, was, yes, but it's getting better. <laughs> Again, we, we need to think about these things. We need a methodology, we need a structure. It's not, I was going to say, it's not just laws, it's not just our democratic structures that are disintegrating with this approach. It's also the outcomes that we expect from these voluntary actions are also being failed. And it's not just uh, payment systems, because um, one of these big companies, executives, once told me like, where it really hurts is um, when it comes to adverts. So if um, somehow an advertiser is unhappy that uh, their ads are associated with a certain kind of content, that's obviously hitting the bottom line um, of all the big hosting companies, uh, such as Google, uh, Facebook, and so on. So, so that's also a matter of concern because also, as is well known, like for example, the free speech standards of the advertising companies are very different uh, from, from the ones that you have um, under more general standards, such as the one under the uh, ICCPR. Briefly, if I can advertise, uh, Edwin just published a document, uh, a booklet on human rights and privatized law enforcement which is on edwy.org slash papers. And one of the things we looked at, one of the things that was tremendously depressing, was looking at uh, SOGBA section 104, which uh, created a liability exemption for um, service providers, payment network providers, internet advertising services, advertisers, internet search engines, domain name registries, and domain name registrars, taking ad hoc, voluntary, lawless, uh, vigilante measures against uh, foreign services if there was reasonable belief of theft of US property, law not being mentioned. When we were researching the, the booklet, we discovered that every single one of those industries now has an agreement of some sort with either the uh, IPR industry or more often the White House to do what was foreseen in SOPA. Does anybody know what uh, Congress is for anymore? I mean, if, if, if you have a democratic process, if the democratic process doesn't accept this approach, and if the companies say what the hey will do it anyway, what's the point? You're basically saying with the defeat of SOPA and the US and US actor in the EU, that though it's this kind of thing still going on anyway, but in, in a roundabout way, you know, the companies are asked to be doing this voluntarily. Well, the, the, there are specific agreements. There's a uh, payment provider agreement with the White House. There's a advertising network uh, <coughs> agreement with the White House. And they're all in place. So, so yeah, it's SOPA 104 with more risks for the for the companies than would otherwise have been the case has been enacted as as planned. Is the same thing happening in Europe as well? Um, the this is where it gets a bit peculiar. Um, there is there is an IPR enforcement directive which is due to be probably renewed after the upcoming elections. And um, I know some of the big US companies have been lobbying for some time for a follow the money approach, uh, which would follow approximately the, the same the same strategy. Yeah, question. Should I go to the microphone? 
So the IRS uh, in the U.S. has a bounty system uh, where if you report a company or an individual, you can get up to 30%. And the concern is, as big data grows and you talk about following the money and payments, that there is be an incentive for companies to come along and start gathering data for the purposes of collecting these bounties. And the U.S., the tax regime here has a global source rule, so it follows U.S. citizens across the world. And I know the U.K. was considering this at one point as well. And to the extent that this model uh, grows for bounty collection and privatizing the bounty for enforcement, uh, I was just wanting your thoughts to you know, how, what you guys think and how that can be prevented. Because to me, this is something that not a lot of people are talking about. But I think the co combination of big data with the bounty and privatization of tax evasion, quote unquote, that is very problematic. Um, so one of your thoughts. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. So as you're imagining it, you're thinking normally the bounty hunter in, in the, with, is, is, has some kind of tip or knows that their neighbor's not paying taxes. Or they work for the company. Or, or they work for the company, they call it in, they get a share. Now you're posing a hypothetical where the um, company that has data aggregation may discover that, you know, I have, my, my money is stashed here and I obviously probably not reporting it, right? So that the, the, the person who's going to tip off the IRS is also the data aggregator, is that? That's one possible fear? scenario. But the okay. other possible scenario is it creates a financial incentive for companies to come into existence or morph their business model to take the data they already have and use it for the purposes of spotting uh, contradictory information for the purpose of deeper evaluation because there's monetary benefit they would gain from this. Um, so yeah. that's a concern that I have. Well, I think it's, it's a new one. I haven't thought about it, but that's it. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. You also see other scenarios where other bounty systems could be created yes. to benefit from yes. that. And that is like the ultimate voluntary measure, you know. So, yeah, that's we'll have to go and think about that one. Maybe. Is there any other comments or questions on the issues of payments? I'm going to move on to another, um, in Joe's uh, report that he was talking about, um, also talk about blocking domains, which is um, you know, quite a, a, a big thing. Joe, do you want to talk a little bit about blocking domains and how that's, uh, how that's been impacting? Well, I'm slightly behind schedule because I unfortunately haven't been uh, reading the EFF website as uh, diligently as I, as I normally do, uh, because there was there's a, uh, a story from uh, the day before yesterday uh, that a Mexican... <laughs> I can ask Julian to explain. Um, but um, a Mexican protest site was... Uh, a domain was uh, taken offline uh, by GoDaddy. Uh, and according to the EFF, uh, with the U.S. emphasis help. Uh, and again, this goes back to the, the, uh, the SOFA idea that you can get domain name uh, <coughs> registries and registrars to, to reach outside the U.S. and, uh, and take action. And there was a, a bizarre example a few years ago um, of a British gentleman living in Spain uh, running uh, a tourist service. Uh, so he was um, providing uh, travel services to Cuba. He had no relationship whatsoever with the United States, uh, and, uh, or at least he didn't think that he had. Uh, however, um, he, his activities ended up on some sort of official US watch list, and uh, the domain name uh, registrar that he used to uh, buy his domain names happened to be a US company that happened to pay attention to a US watch list. So the guy living in Spain wanders into work one morning and he's got no domains anymore. So he's got no websites anymore, he's got no email anymore, and uh, eventually he worked out that uh, the US company had uh, taken it upon himself, uh, upon itself to take vigilante Wild West action and uh, remove his business from, from the internet. Sadly, that sort of thing happens all the time when you're looking at countries like that because I, mean, I, I had a frantic call sometime last year from uh, a nice young man um, in Austria who had been given my number by a friend and he had been kicked out of his Airbnb. Um, 
because he happened to be an Iranian citizen and have an Iranian passport. Now, he'd been living in the EU for quite some time and also had residency there, but whatever he had used, when he verified his Airbnb account, he had used his Iranian document, and as you know, US sanctions against these countries prevent people from um, using some of these services. We've seen it with you know, Google Ads in the Persian language, even though there are other countries that have Persian speakers. We've seen it with um, the time that Apple, an Apple store refused to sell a laptop to um, a woman who was speaking Farsi in the store. That was really just a, a shameful situation. Um, but then we see it somewhat more legitimately where companies go overboard in their attempts to enforce sanctions or they don't need to, and I know that that's not the topic of this, and there's a whole bunch of resources out there if that topic does interest you, but, but that's the sort of thing where you know the companies are kind of making their own calls and often going far overboard, and really it, it kind of does turn into vigilantism at some point. And I think like, one of the things that this highlights is the difficulty to have remedy in the situations. I think like, people just don't really know what to do, what to go, and so since the, the, the measures have been on a voluntary basis, because would be um, if there's anything on other terms and conditions or policies, and you know whether those are sufficiently respectful of you know the sort of at least basic uh, standards uh, processes. But, but that's one of the big uh, that's one of the big difficulties in the space in, in relation to those. Because if you still have sometimes you, you know in relation to the legal framework, you know you still have access to the courts. But you know, because most of the time, what happens is that people, the companies rely on their terms and conditions, well, then we really have a problem here in, in relation to having a, an effective remedy. And this is key as well to you know, what we were talking about in, in putting this panel together is, you know, what is the redress for users? What is the, the remedy? So part of um, what we wanted to achieve with this panel was trying to, you know, come up with some kind of methodology of how we can assess these voluntary measures. You know, what, what kind of framework do companies want? What, what kind of framework do users want? So I think this might be, we were talking about our methodology for assessing voluntary measures, but I think there should be some kind of, you know, maybe redress for users, you know, if, if, if um, users are affected by blocking content, domain payment blocking, what can users do, you know, what are the resources that are out there, and is there more what pressure can put on companies for this. But um, I know, Joe, that you were interested in kind of putting together this, this methodology and this, this framework, so I wonder if we can kind of get together some, maybe some next steps in, in involving the room and uh, seeing what we can come up with. Uh, yes, so uh, um, the Stockholm Internet Conference, uh, Stockholm Internet Forum last year, we had a, a non-conference session where we had a discussion about what are the, the most obvious issues that need to be addressed. What, how do we assess these um, uh, voluntary measures? And we come up with uh, eight um, fairly primitive uh, basic principles, uh, which you can find on edvi.org slash sif13. Um, but there is so much that needs to be done. We're, we're talking about, the, the, there's a whole issue around uh, predictability and the rule of law. There's an issue around redress mechanisms. There's an issue around achieving the public policy aims that, that are um, being sought, um, ranging from protecting children to protecting copyright, which are not the same thing. Um, and uh, a lot of work needs to be done. And I think, I, I hope it's clear from this session, it's clear to, it was already clear to me that this work is quite urgent and needs to be done. So, um, but it might be interesting to, to get some feedback, uh, particularly from the industry uh, participants in the room, about the appetite to actually do some real work on this issue and uh, move us forward. Because I hope it's clear that things really shouldn't continue the way they are. You abuse me. Um, so, um, I'm with Greenhost and we're a, a hosting provider, not a very big one, but in a way we are an intermediary to a lot of stuff and we, we receive a lot of uh, takedown requests, usually from uh, individuals and then we don't take stuff down, 
Uh, but to talk to the uh, overarching problem, I think to me it is clear that is, uh, if you are a company who's making business actually by getting discussions and debates from uh, the public space into your private space to make money out of that, which is a, a, a model that a lot of these uh, Silicon Valley companies use and also companies elsewhere. I think what you bring in there uh, is also the, uh, that, that you, you actually uh, should also bring the human rights as you usually are able to invoke them uh, against states should also be brought inside that discussion. So we should say to Facebook, well, if you feel that, uh, or if you are taking discussions from the streets or the public internet to your private uh, space and uh, are doing that in such a way that people cannot choose to be on Facebook or somewhere else and have conversations between them, then you should also take the responsibility for uh, for keeping to human rights standards because you are basically, you are the jury, the judge and the executioner of your own platform. And if you're doing that and, and doing that to such an extent that you are uh, the only one left where all the discuss discussions are hosted, then you should uh, take that as a responsibility. So for me, uh, either voluntarily or involuntarily, we should find a way in which uh, human rights can be invoked not only to, uh, uh, di can directly be invoked not only to uh, states but also to uh, companies that work in this way. Uh, I think it's a very good point. And uh, actually, uh, I was just going to add that. Um, I mean, clearly, um, the, the, there are standards, um, human rights standards that are applicable to companies that uh, they must respect. Well, it's not binding in the same way as uh, national legislation, but certainly um, the, uh, the principles on human rights and, and business, and uh, actually Lucy uh, speak to that a lot better than, uh, a lot better than me, uh, but these standards um, need to be respected, and among those, uh, an important aspect is also due process and having you know, some standards and procedures so that when you get um, a request for takedown, uh, it can be processed according to clear uh, standards. But at the same time, I would also like to add that it's a bit of a double-edged sword because human rights, it's not just about freedom of expression, it's also about privacy, and it's also um, and, and essentially um, rights conflict. So there's a conflict of rights and, 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 and so uh, it may not go the way that you or I would like. And when you say taking responsibility in a way it's already what the governments are saying to a certain extent which is you need to protect these children and it, it'd be very easy to make a human rights argument to say that you know, the life of children needs to be protected, they have a right to life or their right to privacy needs to be protected and that's why a particular material should be, uh, should be taken down. So that's part of the difficulty I think when using the human rights framework in relation to content because it can be used um, in different ways, but, right. which is why I think it's important to, to remember at least to have a process in place to make sure that it's as fair as possible and as balanced as possible. And then I was just like, uh, just one more thing, um, which is that um, at Article 19 we've given some thought more about the, the, the actual legal framework and around notice and take down, um, mostly by reference to uh, the notice and take down regime in the EU. And uh, we've uh, made a proposal um, which is um, essentially based on uh, the Canadian model of notice and notice, and which lays down some of those uh, basic principles. I've got a few copies here if you want to help yourselves, and you can also look on our website. Um, so you have like some basic steps to thinking about uh, those issues. Well, I would say that due process is uh, part of every human rights framework that I know of. So that should be in there, and of course, human rights are not uh, a hierarchical list in which Article 19 is on top. There are a lot of other things in there as well. So there is always a balance. Um, as to notice and takedown, I think a big problem with it. And I think, well, uh, I'm from the Netherlands, and the notice and takedown procedure in the Netherlands was one of the examples used for the uh, European 
uh, idea of, of having such a, a thing in place. And I think the problem there we see in, in how companies are executing this is there is there is not really due process in that um, there is a legal threat from one side and not from the other side because uh, the relation with the customer is only formed uh, by the TOS, uh, through the uh, TOS. So um, if we want to do something now and not wait for legislation, what we should do is try to have like uh, a well-formed, uh, juridically sound uh, or legally sound framework for TOSs that, uh, that, that companies could implement which would walk the human rights back into uh, terms of services. So that would be the short-term solution. The long-term solution would be, because there will still be a lot of rogue companies that will not be wanting to do this for whatever reasons, um, is to try to see if this can also be put into legal frameworks. And, uh, so being a contracts lawyer myself, I always think that we need to start with the terms of service and then move out into the statutory framework, so I agree. And I think the challenge is going to be beyond thinking about hosts and intermediaries generally. If we talk about payments, domains, and others, I think we're, we're, we're actually even further behind in thinking about those terms of service and human rights, because at least we're thinking about privacy of some human rights in the terms of service with Facebook and others. But, but so that's going to be an even greater challenge, and I think it's got to be part of the, is, is, is looking at all intermediaries as part of this this ecosystem. Uh, just one more thing I just think in, in, in relation to the UK case, um, one of the things I wonder is um, actually there comes a point when the, the government becomes so involved in, in brokering what the uh, ISPs or other intermediaries are doing and when this has such a clear effect on freedom of expression um, that, you know, that there is a strong argument to be made that, you know, th this is um, actually um, the, the, the legal framework, the, the human rights framework does apply, because here in this case, if, if you're exercise, you know, exercising something that impinges so much on, on human rights, and there is no legal basis for it, I think, but, but yet the state is involved in drawing up white lists and, and so forth. Um, yes, there's a question here, I think, or perhaps an argument to be made that um, this could be taken further um, using the usual channels and challenging it in court, possibly. And what about the standardising in terms of service? Is this something that, you know, would that be a first step towards this methodology that, that we're kind of trying to take out of the ground? You know? I think that would be a very good start. Uh, and as I said, I think um, I think it should slowly become clear, particularly with uh, the uh, the Indian example, that um, it's it's not quite as simple as it seems for um, for companies that you just say we can do whatever we want, and nobody's going to exploit that. Um, so definitely, one aspect is to try to. Um, persuade companies to rein in their, their we-can-do-anything uh, terms of service. Um, but it's it's only part of quite a complicated uh, set of issues that needs to be addressed, unfortunately. And the other thing is, I think, just, you know, the, the sort of treating the internet as a unique space. You know, of course, the children absolutely have rights. Think of the children as sometimes legitimately invoked. But at the same time, when you think about the pre-internet world, um, Yes, certain things were hidden from children's view, certain magazines were on back shelves with perhaps some US paper bags over them, um, but you could still buy them, you could still access them. And now with all of these voluntary measures, we're getting to a point where it's become more of a children's world than an adult's world. And so when you think about the terms of service of these platforms, you know, Facebook, for example, and sorry to keep bragging on them, it's just too easy sometimes, they like to say we're a family-friendly platform, but that's not exactly where they were when they launched. Um, they were a you know college boys platform for looking up girls kind of, um, and you know a lot of companies, including that one, will try to have their cake and eat it too. You can't say yes, we're the company that helped make the Egyptian revolution, and then on the other hand say we're family friendly because the Egyptian the Egyptian 
Russian uprising was not exactly family friendly either in many ways. Um, so you really, you know, think about what you really are as a platform, and that comes to that whole thing where, with intent, of course, JDate has a, a, it's a very easy example. JDate has a specific intent. Facebook, not totally clear on what their intent as a service is at this point. Have one more question here, and then I'll give it to Joe for last comment. Good morning, Luca Begli. I work at the University of School of Paris, and I'm the founder of the Dynamic Coalition Net Neutrality. I wanted to uh, underline that I think it is an extremely good idea to analyze all terms of services and the effect that they have. Uh, the fact that they have a normative function that they, exactly as laws they regulate the behavior of people in a, in a transnational fashion, but laws are limited to, with uh, geographical boundaries, whereas terms of services regulate transnational spaces uh, without uh, being framed by constitutional frameworks. So the difference is that laws are framed by constitutional frameworks, terms of services are not. So uh, I, I agree with the gentleman, the Dutch gentleman that was saying that the good, uh, the very good uh, approach is not to, to try to apply uh, uh, international standards to uh, contractual provisions, but to create contractual provisions, to create, to, to look the, 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 the issue from another perspective. So rather than try to apply existing frameworks to create model that can be applied as part of the contract. So to make uh, my, my point clearer, uh, I think it would be worse to create a coalition to, to create model provisions that can frame uh, fundamental rights and then can create private due process mechanism that grant appeal for a private decision so, so that uh, private platforms can adopt this model provision or can fashion their, their terms of services on this model provision. So it is extremely important to discuss what has been done so far, but it's, I, I, I think it is also extremely important to be proactive and to, to produce concrete solutions. And uh, I just want to finish with a, a little example. Uh, last year we have created this dynamic coalition on natural neutrality. We have produced a model law on natural neutrality to, to, pro to produce a concrete solution on how to regulate an extremely difficult issue. I think it could be worth to create a maybe dynamic coalition on platform regulation. Uh, the, uh, the United Nations IGF allows everyone to create dynamic coalitions and that they, are, they could be used as an extremely powerful tool if people want to engage and invest time. So I think it could be worth to think about creating a coalition to define model provisions. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, I'm just out of time, but Joe, did you have the last word on that? Um, well, uh, if, if we could get some buy-in from uh, companies to start a discussion. Uh, I'm not quite sure I understand what a um, uh, private due process might be, but I think establishing some basic principles and basic methodologies for what uh, reasonable terms of service are would already be a good start. I just wanted to um, comment on, on what Gillian said about um, the um, Facebook saying that they're a uh, family friendly uh, company. Something that sounds good in a press release is not necessarily something that is good. Um, there was a, um, a study done by Ofsted, which is the UK schools inspectorate. So not uh, long-haired hippies, uh, but rather conservative um, school inspectors. And they looked at filtering of the internet in schools. And they found that children's education and children's ability to deal with dangers was undermined by over strict uh, filtering in schools. And that it was important to allow children to experience the real world and to learn about risk. In a self-regulatory, so-called self-regulatory environment, no company would ever put out a press release saying, we're going to let children experience risk because it's good for them. <laughs> it wouldn't happen. But it is actually what is best for them. So if we rely on, on government by press release, we will get policies that are not good policies. Thanks, John. I think that's a really good point to finish on. So I just want to thank the panel, um, Gabrielle, Gillian, Anita and Joe, and thanks for everyone who made interventions from the floor. That was really great. Thank you.